live. Awesome. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is William Randall, and I'm a campus recruiter with Mercer. Um, today, I have with me several colleagues that support our health and benefits business. Uh, we have Dana Johnson. Um, she is a health and benefits consultant that's based out of Richmond. We have Matt. Um, he is a health actuary analyst that is also based in Richmond. And we have Parshva. Um, he is a health actuary associate that's based in San Francisco. Um, also on the call, uh, we have Ozma Khan. She is our campus recruiter that supports the West Coast. And we have Michaela Seward. She is also a campus recruiter that supports the central market. Um, first off, wanted to thank everyone for joining today's session. Um, the purpose of this call is to provide insight into Mercer's health and benefits business and also give you a closer look into what um, our colleagues are involved in um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, following the presentation, uh, the campus recruitment team will be reaching out to all registered students to provide additional Mercer resources, um, information on future sessions, just like today, as well as the link to the recorded session if you wanna go back and reference the material that's covered. Um, also, um, as positions are being opened, um, our campus recruitment team will also share those opportunities with instructions on how you can apply. And so today's focus is really to give you some insight into our health and benefits work um, and also take some time to answer questions from all the students. So with that being said, um, I believe that's Dana first, is that correct? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am going to uh, go ahead and jump in today. Uh, we're going to start with introductions of my fellow colleagues and myself, and then um, provide you with an overview of Mercer as William referenced. Um, so I'll just go ahead and jump into my career story just to provide you with a little bit of background. Um, so I have been at Mercer for uh, the last 15 years here in our uh, Richmond, Virginia office for the vast majority of that time. Um, this is home for me here in Richmond, which is why uh, I transferred back to the Richmond office. Um, I was introduced to Mercer through an internship program. Um, I attended Old Dominion University and had a major in finance um, and a concentration in insurance and financial services. And so that, um, that um, focus in college led me to Mercer um, because it was directly aligned with insurance and brokerage services. I think that that's kind of rare at Mercer. I think what you typically find is that um, we have people here from all different backgrounds. No one ever says I want to be an insurance agent when I grow up, but that's very rare. Or um, or uh, I want to major in insurance. And so you typically see that people have different, you know, majors and focus, focus areas and then end up here through um, <clears throat> whether it's a session like this or whether it's they find out about us in the market or um, maybe it's a psychology major or econ major or something that aligns but not as, as directly uh, focused outside of some of our specialty areas like the actuarial group that uh, we're going to talk about in a little bit. But that internship was um, uh, invaluable and it really exposed me to uh, this, this path in, in consulting around insurance and uh, employee benefits. When I graduated from college, I returned back home and worked in the financial services industry uh, for about a year and a half, at which point I applied for a position to rejoin Mercer in our DC office and started there full time as an analyst. Um, during that time, I got engaged and decided that I didn't want to have a family in DC, mainly because of the cost of living and just overall work-life balance. And so I was able to transfer from the DC office back home to Richmond, Virginia, where I got married, uh, and a few years later had my first baby boy. Um, and then I worked really hard um, and was promoted from, um, an analyst to an associate um, within Mercer and took on um, several leadership positions within the office. Um, I say, I mentioned those leadership positions because those are very important to your career journey within Mercer is to take opportunities where you can be visible um, outside of your immediate team. Um, and that includes consultants across the country as well as our leadership team. So volunteering and um, 
raising your hand to be a part of various programs, organizations, or groups within Mercer and also without Mercer really helps you move along your career journey. Um, and then I had another baby boy. Um, and then I was promoted again uh, to senior so associate. Um, typically at Mercer, that senior associate level is um, moving into more of a lead consultant role where you move from supporting senior consultants in their book of business to managing um, your own clients and your own book of business. Um, and so after that, I had another baby girl um, and then uh, started really thinking about my career and what was next for me and where I wanted to go. Um, I was able to attend um, a consulting school that we have here at Mercer, which really teaches you the fundamental um, skills that you need um, in terms of executing our consulting style. You know, it, you know, it seems odd that that's placed kind of, you know, at the end of this career journey, um, but those are things that you pick up by working with other consultants, but having that focused attention with colleagues from around the country where you just sit around and talk about and learn and refresh different ideas and consulting styles um, was really a, a, an important thing to do um, to share with colleagues. And during that time, I had an aha moment um, that perhaps I might have been misaligned on the work that I was doing based on my skill set and where I really wanted to go with my career. And I point that out because as an immediate follow-up from that session, I was able to come back and have a really focused conversation with my people manager about my takeaways from that um, that consulting school session and really what I wanted to do with my career. Um, that conversation allowed me to really shift my focus to take on more larger clients in a project management basis uh, as, um, so that I would have exposure to larger clients with more complex issues, whereas before I had been really focused on the smaller market and smaller clients. And so though that's the kind of flexibility that you have in working with Mercer and that you can really make your career be what you want it to be. Um, I've been here, like I mentioned, for the last 15 years and no one year has ever been the same. And that's due to the mix of clients that we have and also um, senior leadership who is really supportive of letting you um, drive your own career and really navigate it where you want it to go. Um, recently, um, I was tasked with starting a racial and ethnic diversity business resource group for Virginia. Um, we launched earlier in the year and have had several sessions since because we really wanted to um, increase diversity um, within our offices. That's become a huge push for us. Not not this isn't a new initiative this has always been um, important for us here at mercer however it's a it has a renewed focus and renewed energy and we're really excited about that particularly in virginia and what that might mean so again going back to taking those opportunities to lead initiatives within the office and increase your visibility um, is is one way to uh, move along your career journey within mercer so what's next i'm not sure but what i do know is that um, wherever i decide to to go within this consulting um, arena that Mercer has my back and it will support me and I can pretty much chart my own future and I feel as though my future within Mercer is limited and it really is unlimited rather <laughs> and it really is up to me to continue to have those conversations with my people managers um, and leadership to drive it where I want it to go. So I'm going to turn it over to Matt who's going to walk through his career journey. Thank you, Dana. Um, as Dana said, my name is Matt Ashbach. I'm an actuarial associate also in the Richmond office working with Dana in Mercer Specialty Actuarial Group. I, if there is a tagline for my career so far, I've been full time now with Mercer for three years, so a little bit more junior in my position, but it's important to recognize that risk isn't always a bad thing. And that may seem weird coming from an actuary, um, but if there's anything that I recognize it's the successes I've had early on in my career. I wouldn't have had them if I didn't step outside of my comfort zone, try something new. And as Dana was mentioning while she was walking through her career path, most of us here when we were young didn't think that we would be consultants for Mercer. Um, and similarly, I wanted to be a teacher for most of my life, you know, up until my junior year when I started going to colleges to tour for uh, math education degrees. 
And it was at my eventual college, Lebanon Valley College, where I was introduced to actuarial science by a career counselor at the college during my tour. And I looked into it and I liked, you know, the challenges that seemed like they would, I would face day to day um, as an actuary. And I gave it some thought and I decided, you know, why not? Why not try actuarial science? I started in the fall of 2013 passed a couple of exams, and then finally landed an internship with Mercer in the actuarial program uh, in Richmond. And I can say honestly that before that internship, there was not a whole lot that I knew about actuarial science. I knew the general guideline of trying to mitigate risk, but I didn't know how that happened or what it looked like exactly. And I can say that after that internship program, Mercer does a great job at educating their interns so that when they return full-time, they know exactly what they're going to be doing. And that was why I accepted the full-time position that I was offered later on, because I knew that Mercer cared about developing their employees or employees from an early start. And I trusted them with my future career. Um, I had to graduate first. I did that in the fall of, uh, sorry, summer of 2017. Uh, my Girlfriend graduated a couple of weeks later and I proposed her at graduation. She said yes, which was exciting. Uh, she moved down with me to Richmond a month later and that's when full-time position started. A lot of learning took place in that first year and we'll get into what the uh, client team looks like uh, here at Mercer, but you're always going to be paired with mentors and hardly ever do you have one team that's exactly the same. So you're working with a lot of really smart people who have a lot of knowledge to pass on. And after working with those individuals for a while, I eventually got enough information, knowledge, to start presenting at client meetings, which was exciting, having wanted to teach for a long time. That's where I finally was able to start you know, spreading the knowledge that I do and helping others understand how these calculations come together. So throughout that process, starting to get more exposure to clients, I was promoted to associate, which was exciting for me. Uh, after that promotion, I was asked to lead the net pick practice for Mercer's Southern region. And that was sort of the first project management exposure that I experienced. Another situation where I could have said, no thanks, I'm comfortable with the responsibilities I have today, but I thought, why not? You don't know how far you can go until you challenge yourself. Um, and that was a challenge for me, but I haven't regretted it since making that decision. Finally got married last summer um, after a quick trip to Ireland for our honeymoon, came back to working, and after the associateship promotion, I started transitioning into more of a project management role. I volunteered as a buddy for the internship program, and we may have time to talk about what that looks like, but really the buddy for new hires is just that first resource to make sure that new hires are comfortable, that they can have all their questions answered, know exactly what a full-time position looks like. Shortly after that, last fall, I participated in my first sales effort, which for me was you know, scary at first. I'm a bit of an introvert, um, but really, really glad that I ended up taking that opportunity. The team that I was placed with for that um, effort really helped me develop and be able to sell Mercer. We won the business as a team. That's my greatest accomplishment so far to date at Mercer. I'm nearing my ASA. I have one exam and modules to go, sitting for that one exam in December. So hopefully my future uh, includes credentials soon, um, but I'm excited for everything else that comes my way. And I'll pass it over to Parshva. Thanks, Matt. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Parsha Shah. I am a senior associate out of San Francisco. Um, I have been working for several years now, been at Mercer for two years, um, but started my career out in, um, in retirement back in the day. Did that for about four years and then moved on to um, health and benefits. Um, but as you can see on here, I took my first internship actually right after high school. Um, so I very early on knew that I wanted to pursue a career in actuarial science. Um, growing up, I always loved math a lot. And so it was kind of a natural progression in that regard. And I also had a dream to be a pilot someday. Luckily, I was able to achieve that as well. So the funny thing was the last, very last exam I actually took in college was my aviation exam, where I had to fly and prove that I can actually make that flight. Um, but I went to University of Illinois, um, amazing school, really loved it there. 
Um, after that, I graduated and moved on to Chicago. I started my first full-time job at Watson Wyatt, um, which is now Willis Charles Watson. Um, you'll see again with my chart here, I've kind of boomeranged back to a couple of companies over the years, um, or three companies actually. So Milliman I interned, then uh, did another job in Milliman, um, had started my first job at Watson Wyatt, which is now Willis Charles Watson, came back to them as well. Um, I had interned at Deloitte, worked for them full-time as well. Um, but overall, um, actual science is kind of what connects all the dots for me. And I'm very happy to say that I found my home at Mercer. Uh, don't really plan on leaving anytime soon. <laughs> um, but a few other things that I've loved over the years was um, when I moved to Minneapolis, or actually, let me start at Chicago. Um, I love living in downtown Chicago, amazing place. Don't think any other place has such amazing buildings. Um, even San Francisco doesn't compare, I feel. Um, but that was that. Uh, then I kind of moved to suburbia, uh, moved to Minneapolis in 2009, um, discovered my love for snow. Didn't think I would ever leave Minneapolis either, uh, but long and behold in 2015, my family. Uh, so during my time that I got married, had a kid, we moved to San Francisco. Um, luckily it's Northern California, not Southern California. Otherwise we would have moved back to Minneapolis in a heartbeat because we cannot deal with the heat. Um, luckily I live in the hills in San Francisco. So it's really cold here most of the time. Today is actually really hot, so I have a fan next to me which I switched off right now. <laughs> um, but I would say the thing which is most important is um, Mercer, we treat everybody as a family. All of us are a team. Um, that's that's one of the main reasons why I love Mercer so much. Um, nobody really treats each other in a way that, hey, I'm your boss, you gotta go do this. I don't care about what you have going on. People always uh, step in for anything that happens. Um, even right now when you're working remotely, we always make sure if people have any issues, we don't burden them with, hey, we have a deadline. Not my problem, you gotta go do it. Uh, we always step in for each other. And um, to kind of the point of Dan and Matt, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity at Mercer. Since I've joined Mercer, I've been able to take on a lot of leadership roles as well. Um, the very first thing that I got to do was uh, lead the health and benefits tech industry um, as being the survey lead. So any sort of surveys that happen in tech are basically go through my my computer in that sense. <laughs> um, and it, it helps that uh, we live in San Francisco and in the Silicon Valley. So um, um, other than that, I have always loved recruiting and I participate in recruiting efforts all across my career. And luckily when I moved to SF uh, in, in Mercer, uh, I had the opportunity to lead the actual recruiting for the SF office. So I'm sort of the main point of contact and really the primary people manager pretty much always whenever somebody joins. Um, and since I've had so many people join over the years, I've had to keep shuffling them off to other people managers end of the day. Um, but yeah, the point being, you get a lot of opportunities here. If, if you want to do something, all you have to do is talk to your people manager, talk to the people you work with, and they will make it happen for you. That's all I had for now. Thank you. Thank you, Parshva. Um, so one thing that we want to first introduce you to as we begin to lay out what our work looks like is a quick introduction to Marshall McLennan Companies, also known as MMC for short. So MMC is our parent company and it consists of four operating companies, uh, Marsh, Guy Carpenter, Mercer, and Oliver Wyman. So Marsh and Guy Carpenter are on the risk and insurance services side. They're working with groups to ensure that they have uh, different measures in place that match their risk tolerances as a group. Um, Oliver Wyman and Mercer work on the consulting side. So Oliver Wyman differs from Mercer a little bit in that they are more research focused. So they'll be working with, and they are working with industry experts to answer a lot of the questions that are at the foreground of today's environment. For example, they have been evaluating the impact of climate change on the economy. They have the one thing that they're in the news for recently today is COVID-19 modeling, you know, projecting how long we expect the virus to stick around with certain assumptions. And Mercer's actually pulled in a lot of that work for the estimates that we've been providing to our clients specifically for the impacts of the virus on health plans. So it's neat that while each of these companies is their own separate thing, we borrow a lot from each other and we really maximize the benefit of this MMC partnership that we have. Uh, but for Mercer, where we're focusing today, because that's where the three of us work, um, we have three lines of business, wealth, health, and career. 
wealth focuses in on retirement plans, so 401ks and pensions. Career focuses in on talent acquisition and retention. And health focuses specifically on um, employer health plans such as medical benefits, dental vision, LTD, everything that would be considered a health plan, we are working with employers and other groups to ensure that the offerings that they have match uh, you know, their future aspirations, um, make sure that it fits in with their available budget, and make sure that you know, the offerings that they have are pleasing to their employees as well. On the next slide, we have just a brief grid that shows that while we sort of do, or the end goal for our clients is to provide, you know, consulting information or advice that helps them get to where they want to go. Um, we group each of our clients into these four buckets. The idea being that a company that has 200 employees in comparison to a company that has 400 employees, they all, generally speaking, have similar issues that they're concerned about they have similar goals in place. And so early on in your career at Mercer, you're going to get exposure to each of these four buckets, the enterprise, mid-market, large, and jumbo. And really why we focus on doing it that way is so that you have proper exposure to all of the concerns across the market and all of the solutions across the market. And so when you start to progress further on into your career, if there's one of these buckets or one of these groups of employer size that you really enjoy working with, again, a conversation you can have with your people manager is making sure that you know, the portfolio of clients that you have, um, do you serve that best? And maybe you serve that best in having more jumbo clients if you work really well with jumbo clients. So lots of opportunity um, and the ability to choose to an extent, what client size you work on down the road. Thanks, Matt. I'm gonna walk us through um, what do we do in the employer segment, which is where Matt and I are, are focused. Um, you know, the core of what we do is employee benefit strategy and brokerage, um, that top, top left-hand corner. Everything else that you see on this list are things that Mercer provides um, and can be part of that overall employee benefit strategy and brokerage or something that an employer might engage us um, to help them with on a one-off or project basis. But the core of what we do is employee benefit strategy and brokerage. Um, voluntary benefits, individual benefits, executive benefits, those are the types of things that, you know, we work with employers to round out their benefit package um, to ensure that they're offering a competitive um, overall package that helps them attract and retain their employees. Um, and some employers decide that they want to take a little bit of a different approach for their executives than they do for their um, kind of rank and file, so to speak, although all employees are just as important, right? Um, but sometimes they want to differentiate those benefits for the executives. And so we work with a team to help them put together a good suite of benefits for their executives. Um, we have specialty practices that include uh, wellness and well-being because um, we know that um, well-being is really important and if someone is in a good space mentally and that their health is um, in good condition that they're going to be a more productive employee right but it's and the other side of that is it's the right thing to do to take care of your employees so um, employers have different reasons for why they tackle something like wellness and well-being. And so our job is to really understand what the goal is. Is it to have more productive employees? Is it to round out your package and so that it's, it's a, a more attractive benefit? Is it because it's just the right thing to do? And based on what that answer is, that helps us provide better consulting um, so that we're really getting to the target um, of what they're trying to achieve, but we have resources that help in that area. Um, we have specialty resources that help with pharmacy, um, flexible benefit, every area that you can imagine that might fall under the umbrella of health and benefits. Uh, we have specialists so that the lead consultants can really work with um, 
the clients to get to know them, understand their objectives, and really um, translate that internally to identify the right resources um, that really have the depth of knowledge to be able to um, offer expert um, advice. Now, that's not to say that as a lead consultant, we don't provide consulting in these areas, but we are supported in each one of these areas by uh, specialty resources who know the ins and out of it, and we can loop them in at any point. So just to kind of go over a few more of these international benefits, for example, we um, primarily, as you would imagine, I work with Virginia-based employers, but sometimes those Virginia-based employers have employees outside of the country. Um, the benefit landscape outside of the U.S. is very different than inside of the U.S. And so relying on subject matter experts who know the ins and outs and rules and regulations in each area is really important so that we can leverage them to make sure that we're not only keeping our, um, our clients compliant and aligned with market norms inside the U.S., but outside of the U.S. as well when that's applicable. Um, clients also look to us to help them not only broker um, their benefits um, and provide strategy, but they look to us to help them administer their benefits as well. And so we have a group that focuses on benefit administration. So when you go to your first job for the first time, a lot of times you're enrolling in your benefits through an online platform or through an 800 number where you may get assistance in navigating the benefit selection process. Mercer offers those solutions to our client um, to provide that um, to provide those services for their employees. And also, this is under the umbrella of healthcare reform, um, but as you can imagine, the employee benefits um, arena is heavily legislated and regulated. And so not just specific to healthcare reform, our, a big part of our job is helping keep our clients compliant overall, making sure that they're aware of all of the things that they need to do as they administer their plan and make sure that nothing slips through the cracks um, so that they can sleep well at night and know that the ERISA police are not gonna knock at their door uh, to come because they've missed something. So that's a big part of, of what we do with our clients. Um, on this next slide, sorry, skipped ahead a little bit too quickly. Um, these topics are a lot of what we've been hearing from our clients in the last six months or so. These are all things that are top of mind. And if you sit in on any Mercer client meeting while all clients are different, these are the types of topics that always rise to the top and are, are covered within that meeting because we want to make sure that our clients are prepared and have information that they need uh, for the challenging challenges they may be facing. So as you would imagine, COVID-19 has had a um, significant impact on the workforce. Um, employers have had to react to that in the moment, right? Everything from teleworking to safety protocols to how do we budget for this? Because as people may have had exposure to COVID-19 or have been um, diagnosed with COVID-19 or even the testing, what's covered? How is it covered? Is our budget um, sufficient enough to cover any additional impact of COVID, that COVID-19 may have? Or the flip side of that is, we might not have as much utilization um, in the healthcare system because people are at home, they're quarantining, they're not keeping uh, doctor's appointments uh, for you know, optional or routine care. And so we work very closely with people like Matt who help us understand and quantify the financial impact of something like COVID and inform our clients so that they're prepared. One thing I like to say is our job is to make sure that our client has no surprises, right? It's to be proactive and think about things on their behalf. And COVID-19 is just another area that we needed to be proactive and respond timely so that our clients felt like they were prepared uh, to, to react and have the information that they need. Uh, almost all organizations are worried, or not worried per se, but really focused on managing their healthcare costs. You know, if you've done any research on the healthcare industry, we know that the healthcare costs continue to rise at a rate that's higher, outpacing inflation. That's not sustainable, right? So we really work with our clients to understand their budget needs. Even the client that has the most disposable income really wants to make sure that they're spending their dollars wisely and, and very efficiently. So we really work with our clients on budget control and budget management and setting expectations. 
I talked about compliance, the huge part of everything that we do, even when it comes to financial modeling and things that you wouldn't necessarily think have a would have a compliance component to it, um, they do, right? And so it's our job to make our clients aware of that and make sure that they're compliant. So like I mentioned, they can sleep at night because some of these requirements uh, HR professionals can be personally responsible for if they are not in compliance. And so you can imagine that that is top of mind for them. Um, providing a competitive benefits package. Um, if we think back to pre-COVID, it feels so far away, but you know the unemployment rate was at an all-time low. And so providing a benefit package to help differentiate your organization from another organization to attract and retain the best talent is always at the top of the list for the employers that we work with. So really understanding their goals and objectives and what type of talent they're trying to, um, to bring to their organization is something that we talk about routinely so that we can, um, because it informs our consulting. Um, I mentioned well-being before, um, but that's a huge part. More active and engaged um, overall, mentally, physically, and financially, um, employees mean that they're more able to fill, come to job, come to the job, do the work that they've been asked to do, and um, and perform well, right? And so. We've seen employers include these elements as part of their overall well-being program or um, employee benefits program because, like I mentioned before, it's the right thing to do, but it also has long-term benefit for the overall organization. And then lastly, this is very complex, right? No one, this area is complex. No one said that they wanted to start a business um, and to provide employee benefits. Most people, you know, they're really focusing on servicing their clients, their customers, and they want to make benefit administration as simple as possible so that they are freed up to really focus on um, the things that are important to their business and running their business and not, you know, spend so much time administering the benefit for their employees. And so that's where we come in and help make this this whole process a lot more simple um, for our clients so that they can get back to the business of focusing on their business, if that makes sense. Okay, so uh, this slide is important because it starts to give you an idea of the things that we consider when we're putting together a strategy for, our, for the clients that we serve. Um, this is a process that begins um, with the client at the center of it, um, and it really focuses on understanding our client. You know, that means a lot of homework on the front end if it's a new client or if it's a new engagement to really understand what is their business, who are their competitors, who are the people that um, they want to come and work for them. But it's also understanding uh, their demographics as well because people really experience benefits differently based on where they are in their career journey, right? So if you think about a millennial or a new graduate that's going to work for an organization, their goals and priorities are very different than someone who may have been in the working world for a very long time and has different goals and objectives and maybe more focused on preparing for retirement. So one of the things that we do when we first get a new client or we first begin working with a client is to really understand the demographics of their population so that we can put together a customized strategy that really fit, fits their needs. Um, not only do their needs vary based on where they might be in their career journey, but also like communication style. You know, think about maybe a baby boomer, and I don't want to stereotype, but let's think about someone who might want to receive communication through um, an email or maybe a hard copy um, letter in the mail versus someone who is very tech savvy and is used to getting everything through text messages or an app. So our job is to really think through those things on behalf of our clients. So we're not only putting together a benefit package that helps them attract and retain their, their, to their, their employees, but we're also helping them communicate it in a way that, um, that their employees want to be, in a way that um, is communicated effectively as well. Because what's the value of spending all this time in design if then we're not translating it and communicating it on behalf of our clients to their employees so that they understand the value of the package that's been put together for them. 
Um, on this next slide, we go into some of the common types of benefit programs. Um, on the left hand side are probably benefits that you've already heard, you know, whether it be through your own employment or um, maybe your parent or just by doing research on what types of benefits employers typically offer. But these are um, the components that we use to put together an entire benefit package on behalf of our clients. Um, health plans generally include things like medical, prescription drug, stop loss. Stop loss is a component of a medical program. It's not something that's um, employee facing, so you might not be familiar with that concept, um, but it is something that we help secure on behalf of our client and it gets to what something Matt may talk about later and managing the risk on behalf of our clients. Uh, stop loss is a reinsurance um, tool. Uh, dental, vision, employee assistance programs. Those programs make up about 90% of an employer's healthcare spend. Uh, their other side of that are the welfare plans, life insurance, accidental death and dismemberment, short-term disability, long-term disability. Those types of policies are more income protection in the event that something unexpected happens. Um, employers put, include those benefits in their package um, as a proactive way to think about their employees and to make sure that their income is protected should anything ever happen and they're disabled and they can't come to work or in the unfortunate situation of a death and now the person working for the organization can no longer provide income for their family, the, the employers are providing these benefits for peace of mind and um, again, to let people know, we got your back, we have you covered, you have this um, suite of pro um, programs that, um, that cover you and your family. Lastly, um, one of the things that we've been seeing is voluntary benefits. Um, and voluntary benefits are used for a couple different ways. One is to round out a benefit package and offer a more robust competitive offering without increasing the cost for the employer. Voluntary benefit programs are usually offered on an employee E plate paid basis. Um, and there are things that the employee would value and would cost more for them if they went out on the open market to purchase it. But the employer is just offering this as as an access on an access basis. You have access to these programs at lower cost, and employees appreciate the fact that there's group underwriting. And overall, they see that as a, bit, a value add and something that the employer is um, providing that, that really um, rounds out their benefit program. Okay. So next slide, I want to get into how we service our clients. Um, this slide is a pretty comprehensive view of the types of things that, are, that would be included in an insurance and brokerage um, statement of work or scope of service for a client. Um, we help them with all of the things that are listed on this slide plus more, right? So um, at the top, you know, you, you think of one of the differentiators between Mercer and other firms in our area is that we not only focus on the brokerage side of it, which is securing coverage, placing, securing and placing insurance coverage, but we really focus on the consulting as well. So that consulting means providing our clients with thought leadership, um, help making sure that they're aware of market trends, um, and not only aware of market trends, but if they were to adapt those market trends, what does it mean to their bottom line to help them evaluate the options and figure out where they wanna be relative to the competition? Um, we put together, as I mentioned, previously wellness strategies. Um, we help many of our clients put together a strategic roadmap. Some clients um, like to think of things and take things from year to year, whereas you have other clients who are more strategic and like to be more thoughtful and are open to putting together three to five year um, strategic roadmaps. And so we like to meet our clients where they are but knowing that it is a big part of our job to provide that strategic consultant consulting so that we're not just tackling the day-to-day -day issues as they come up, we're really being proactive. And that's one of the things that I find really exciting about working for Mercer is that we're, we're solving problems and being proactive and being thoughtful uh, for our clients. And that's, that's the value that they receive from us and why they continue to make Mercer their 
brokerage partner versus someone else that might be our competition. Day-to-day um, -day support, that's a lot of what we do as well. So it's not all strategy and financials. It's a lot of employee, um, resolving employee issues, um, helping employers think through communication strategies, um, and then also engagement. I'm gonna turn it over to Matt and he's gonna walk us through the bottom half of this slide. Sure, thank you, Dana. Um, so one thing that we definitely do, especially me and others on the actuarial side is pull together a financial analysis. Um, so one thing obviously that is important to note here, while we think about large expenses for an employer, healthcare, health plans are definitely a large expense and it might be more than a lot of you may realize, but you know, per person, it's not unusual for all of these combined plans to cost an employer ten to twenty thousand uh, dollars a year, and that's a lot of money. And so, because it's a lot of money, we have to spend a lot of time making sure that the plan is running as efficiently as it can. Um, and so, one thing we'll do is we'll analyze if there's a year where cost has increased quite a bit. You know, what's causing that cost increase? Are people choosing brand drugs, you know, expensive name brand drugs over retail non-brand drugs that uh, do the same thing but end up being a lot cheaper. Um, what we oftentimes will do, I mean, depending on client sizes, we'll ask the question, you know, are you funding your health plan appropriately for your size and your risk tolerance? And that sort of breaks us into two different funding arrangements that we typically see for our clients, either fully insured or self-funding. Uh, fully insured usually goes along with groups that are smaller in size, that have a lower risk tolerance. And when you uh, fully insure, basically you are going to a healthcare carrier and you're paying a premium. And in exchange, that carrier is going to cover all the claims expenses that run through. So your liability is limited to what you're paying out in premiums. If you decide to self-fund instead, then what you're saying is, you know, I am okay with a little bit more risk instead of paying premiums and having a set uh, liability there, you're paying that carrier to use their network, um, but you are taking on the claims liability itself. So instead of paying these premiums, you're paying the claims as your employees submit them. And what that can do is it can provide a lot of savings. Uh, these insurance companies do build in profits into the premiums that they charge for fully insured arrangements. And so in, a, in an average year, you're going to you know, profit from not being fully insured at the same time. If you have a bad year, you're going to be hit by that bad year because you don't have the protection that the premium for fully insured provides. And so a lot of the times, specifically where we get pulled in as actuaries is for the self-funded side. There's risk that we evaluate and try to manage with different uh, plan features that we put in place, one of which is uh, stop loss coverage that Dana mentioned. Um, what we end up doing a lot of times is you know, going through a consulting process with each of the clients, uh, talking about strategy, and we'll go through what this process looks like in a little bit. But we make sure that depending on what they wanna do with their plans, we give them a price for what that might cost them. Um, we set their budget rates for them. There's also an employee side that they charge their employees for that coverage. We help them model what those employee contributions should be. And lastly, we pull together, you know, accounting statement liabilities that they have to book. Um, so one thing that's important while we think about all of these potential changes to maximize your offerings that you put out there for your employees is we look at benchmarking. And Mercer has one of the largest uh, employer-sponsored surveys that we send out to each of our clients each year. And it asks different questions about, you know, what benefit offerings do you have? What does your strategy look like over the next couple of years? And from that, we have this wonderful, you know, warehouse of data that we can use to help employers see if their offerings are competitive to other peers in their individual markets. 
And so that's one thing when we were talking about the employee contributions, what should you charge? If you don't have a comparison point, it can be very subjective on what you end up charging. But if you know, if you're a bank and we have a financial sector from our survey responses, we can look at what others in the financial sector are charging their employees for similar coverage. Um, and so it's that benchmarking that really allows us to make sure that the employer is offering comparable plans to what's out there in the market. And as Dana also mentioned on legislative compliance, that scenery is changing constantly in the last decade. It's changed dramatically. Um, we have people in place who make sure that all of our clients, with these changes that we're talking about, they're still compliant with all of the legislation that's out there. And so on this slide, once we have you know, some thoughts on strategy, we need to assign a team um, to each of our clients. And this just gives you a brief overview of what that team might look like. Obviously, it's going to depend um, on what the client needs. Not any one client team will be exactly the same as another. And one thing that we touched on earlier is that, you know, there's a lot of variety with who you work with too. Like you might work with someone on two cases, but it's highly unlikely that you'll work with that same person on almost all of your client teams, which is nice. It adds variety in who you get to work with on a day-to-day -day basis. But there's always going to be a lead consultant. They're usually the one that's managing the conversation with the employer to see what they want their benefits to look like. Um, there can be a senior, an associate, or an associate, which is my level. Um, usually they're someone who is involved in those conversations, but they are a little bit more junior. They're in the process of transitioning from analyst to lead consultant. Analyst is going to be the person who's you know, modeling all of the potential changes to the design, um, you know, pulling everything together for open enrollment. Um, they will be pulling everything together for the senior associate associate lead consultant to review and then communicate to the client. Sometimes they do get involved in the communication of the client as well. But if you have a client that has a lot of needs and maybe there are some products that they aren't currently utilizing that Mercer has to offer, you might have a sales team attached to it. You may have a client manager that specifically just works on the relationship aspect between the client and Mercer, make sure that they are happy and that we're meeting their needs. So oftentimes you'll have some asks that require specialty resources and these purple boxes just list out a bunch of the different specialty resources that are often pulled into these conversations. On this slide, you can see a little summary of who we work with. So we made it very clear that we're constantly working with clients and prospects and trying to win new business, which we're always interested in. Um, but purple here, and we talked about, you know, us working with carriers, whether it be self-funded or fully insured, they're the ones that are going to have the data. Um, so whenever we need to model something, we will request information from that carrier. They will help us to ensure that plan changes can be made. They'll help with, uh, you know, actually communicating these changes to each of the employees. Um, so our involvement in our communications with the vendors and carriers is key to the success of any strategy going forward. Uh, in pink here, we have other lines of business. Just because we consult in health doesn't mean that our clients don't have other issues that don't relate to health. You could have a client who is very interested in creating a 401k plan. And because we have these three lines of business, wealth, health, career, we can leverage um, that relationship, pull in somebody else who's an expert in that area that we aren't necessarily experts in and create a relationship there for them to continue on helping with that ask. Similarly, we have hubs, specialists, and centers of excellence that we can pull in for more specific asks. And on the next slide, we have a brief overview of, well, I guess it's pretty comprehensive of all the different uh, expertise areas and centers of excellence that we can um, sample throughout the year uh, for a plethora of different needs and requirements and asks.
And then on this slide, there's always a consulting process that we follow, whether it be strictly or loosely, loosely in that a couple of steps are combined. But the idea here is obviously to have a conversation with them early on in the process to figure out what's needed and these steps follow through to make sure that we help them get to where they want to go. And so Dana will go into a little bit more detail on this process. Yeah, so as Matt mentioned, you know, some clients have a more, we follow this on a more formal basis and sometimes it's a little bit more loose. And so when it's formal, you know, it, we really follow this and incorporate it into our annual um, service calendar. Um, whether it's the beginning of a relationship or whether it's the beginning of um, the year and it's time to refresh, we really want to make sure that we understand our client. That's the key to a successful relationship because all clients want to make sure that we are providing them with tailored consulting and advice that is specific to their business and their needs and not just kind of canned um, uh, solutions. Um, and so that's really key. Uh, the next step is analyzing um, options, analyzing, evaluating different scenarios so that our clients can make informed decisions um, based on the, the, the suggestions and, and advice that we're providing. Um, third step of that is to um, put that design, that um, strategy into place. Um, and execute on what we've come up with during our strategy sessions. And, um, and that doesn't start once it's been um, put into place. We wanna measure it, right? Companies wanna make sure that there's a return on their investment. So that requires us to monitor whatever program or um, service that we implement on behalf of our clients for their employees. And then it's time to refresh, right? Let's take a look at everything that we did. Did that work? Did that not work? What were the bumps in the road? What were things that we would do differently next time? And let's incorporate that as we start this cycle all over again. And that takes us back to the understanding process. Some clients like to document that process, whereas others is a little bit loose, right? Um, and so what I'll do is I'll show you what that looks like when a client likes to have a documented strategic placemat that includes information about their environment, uh, things that would be important for um, someone who it might be new to the organization or taking on the role to know so that, um, that, that they have a documented strategy. Other times um, clients use this are generally the contacts that we work with are within human resources, whether it's the human resources manager or benefits director or VP of human resources, they then have to report up to their leadership team. So a lot of times um, with our client contacts use a placemat like this to report up to their leadership team to provide um, a status on where things are with their benefit program um, and what their goals and objectives are. So we wanna make sure that we're capturing the environment. We wanna make sure that we're capturing guiding principles. Those are things that an employer doesn't wanna compromise regardless of what the circumstances might be. Um, and so we really think a lot about what are those things that are important for your benefit program that do, don't wanna be compromised. And then we really get into strategy and from that strategy comes the actions. And then we always wanna think about barriers because we want our clients to implement a successful strategy. So a big part of the design process of um, our strategy recommendations is thinking through the barriers with our clients so that we can address it, so that we can have a successful outcomes that are measurable and that we can look back on and say, okay, we've accomplished the thing that we wanted to accomplish with this process. And then it starts all over again and we refresh this on a, um, on a regular basis with our client. I skipped over this annual health service cycle and I won't go into it in too much detail for the sake of time, but know that our annual service cycle begins and it looks a lot like the um, consulting process that I mentioned on that prior slide, right? So each year it starts with planning, it starts with benchmarking, it starts with getting into um, the actual business of renewing their plans and um, brokering their coverage. It goes into implementation and then communicating it out to their employees, a debrief with the clients, talk about the year and how did it go, and then we start that cycle all over again. Uh, for the next upcoming year. Sometimes right now we're starting conversations with our clients about 2022 renewals and effective dates 
because it's a constant cycle once you're done with the current year to just continuously think about it and renew and refresh your program. Um, for the sake of time, we're gonna cover this lab pretty quickly, but we wanted to show you an example of what an output from a strategy session might look like. Um, this step might be after the discovery phase, now we've socialized some ideas and we wanna go back to our client to help them understand the financial impact of some of the strategies we've discussed. This is what a slide might look like um, within a client presentation. And there's a lot of work that goes into preparing something like this. We work with our specialty resources in each of these areas that's identified on the slide to really make sure that we are considering our client's condition, um, their financial state, their specific information, and quantifying what the impact of each one of these options might be for their plan and really help them think through, okay, we've evaluated all the options, which, which do we actually wanna execute on? Um, the other piece that we'll go over quickly because we want to, uh, we're right at the end of the time, and that is, as you can imagine, the healthcare industry is exploding with um, startup organizations um, that really are focused on specific areas within the healthcare arena. Um, and so they're really getting targeted in their approach. Um, you can imagine that employers are receiving calls from these organizations on a daily basis all day right so it's our job on behalf of our clients to be aware of um, the change that's happening within the industry and to really vet these solutions on their behalf so that our clients have peace of mind that if they get a call from someone that we are able to provide expert um, guidance on whether or not that's a solution or an organization that they would want to partner with um, and offer their that company's um, solution to their employees. The flip side of that is we proactively review these options on behalf of our client so that we can take these tailored recommendations to them um, as a solution uh, to, their, to their needs. So it could go work either way. An employer comes to us and asks for more information or we go to them proactively because we have vetted all of these solutions through our Center for Health Innovation and we feel confident that this is uh, a solution or a company that they can partner with. This next slide gives you just an, a snapshot of, of all of the various organizations that are popping up outside of the typical core um, health insurance carriers and why it's more important than ever to work with a consulting firm like Mercer to help an employer think through what is it that they want to target, how do they want to offer it to their employees, and then what's the right vendor um, for them to partner with to deliver the solution that they want to for their employees. So, Long story short, we help our, our clients navigate this, this arena so that they can make the best choice for their organization and their employees. Okay, so we're a little bit over time, but we wanna just go through a few quick tips that we think are important for success. Um, the main thing I think is most important is network. Uh, get to know your classmates, your colleagues, and other people um, because you never know when you might need um, those relationships, whether it's just to ask a question or to help you navigate um, uh, an obstacle at work or whether it's just to vent, quite frankly. I can't, uh, the, the value of venting sometime with people that understand uh, where you are and in your career is, is really valuable, right? So just create those relationships so that you have that opportunity when needed. Um, raise your hand, be eager to jump in and add value. Um, that really sets you apart from, um, from other colleagues. Not that, and, and Mercer isn't a competitive um, in the sense that we're competing against each other. Your competition is really yourself. I wanna be better than I was last year. And the way that I do that is to continue to learn, continue to grow, and that means raising my hand and volunteering for opportunities. Ask questions. Um, we were all new at one point. We all know that this, this field is not um, necessarily, it's not rocket science, but it's, com it's, com it's complicated. And, um, 
And so colleagues are always willing to pitch in and help and answer any questions that you might have. Um, take classes around Excel and project management. That's a huge component of our jobs. And it's great if you come in understanding basic project management skills and knowing how to um, navigate Excel. And um, the last thing is seek out mentors. Mentors are equally as important as building out that network um, because you have a safe space to ask questions and seek advice that you might not want to or be ready to socialize with your people manager. And I have, I mean, at first two go together, never get too comfortable. If you get too comfortable, you're probably not challenging yourself but to the extent that you should be. Um, and at the same time, if you do challenge yourself appropriately, mistakes are going to happen and that's okay. You shouldn't be afraid of making mistakes. Um, if you ever have anything that comes up and you're not sure how to handle it, just reach out to people, ask for help when you need it. And it's important to stay humble in that process and not be intimidated by people who are more senior than you are, who have more experience, uh, are better at their job than you are currently. Instead, you should collaborate with those individuals, get what you can from them, learn from them, and that collaboration will create a better final product and everyone will win. Um, but then my last is just partner with a company that cares and that can be interpreted in a couple of ways cares about your development internally or cares about you know the world in general dana's on the mercer cares commission so she would agree that mercer does care um but you know just make sure that whoever you decide to partner with that it's the right fit for you um you should be interviewing the company that you're interning with to make sure that it's the right fit for you. Well, awesome, awesome. Um, wanted to personally thank you guys, Matt, Dana, and Parshva for presenting to the students this afternoon. Um, I think you've shared some very insightful information um, and I hope that you know everyone on today's call found value in the material that was shared and hopefully you learned a little bit more about us as well as the work that we do. Um, again, following today's presentation, there will be some outreach conducted by our recruiting team. Uh, we, we will provide additional Mercer resources. Um, again, we'll provide today's recording. That way you can reference the material later. Um, and we'll also be following up with additional application information. But again, um, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, we really enjoyed spending some time with you and we'll talk again soon. Have a great week. Bye-bye.